Howdy! Welcome to Elementary Statistics. I am Lance Curtis and this is the lecture for Section 6.2, Applications of Normal Distributions. First we'll look at the process for standardizing normal distributions, which we more or less covered in the last lecture, but we're going to get into it more specifically in this one. Then we'll look at how to calculate probabilities and percentiles uh, for specific instances, and then we'll get into a discussion of z-scores and areas, and finalize our lecture with discussion of conversion process. So let's get into it. This section illustrates how to work with non-standard normal distributions. As I said before, in the previous lecture, StatCrunch makes it really easy to deal with non-standard normal distributions. But it's a good idea to know what is it that that normal calculator is doing in the background so that you understand more of what it is you're looking at. This helps us to make better use of the, of the numbers that, that the statistics give us, which enables us to make better conclusions. So first of all, a non-standard normal distribution might be one where the mean is not zero. It could also be one where the standard deviation is not one. Or it could be that both of these uh, criteria apply. So the mean is not zero and the standard deviation is not one. Typically, in the real world, this is the case that you find. Now, there's a simple conversion process that allows us to standardize any normal distribution. So the tools that we were looking at in the previous section become then available to us. Let's look at this process for standardizing normal distributions. So there's a simple equation that converts random variables and non-standard normal distributions to z-scores in standard distributions. And it's the equation that we've seen before for calculating a z-score. It's the one and the same. So here we have the random variable, subtract out the mean, divide by the standard deviation, and that gives us a z-score, which then makes our normal distribution standardized. Now, if we rewrite this equation in terms of x, we can then convert back the other way. We can take a standard normal distribution and convert it to our non-standard normal distribution. So when we do that, we get this equation for x. You take the mean, and then you add the product of the z-score and the standard deviation. This then converts it back to the non-standard normal distribution. So we use our z-score equation to standardize a normal distribution. And then we use the same equation solved for x in order to quote-unquote de-standardize the normal distribution. Here's an example of how this might work so we can illustrate this, this conversion process. So let's say we have a non-standard normal distribution with a mean of 1,010 and a standard distribution of 20. We simply apply this simple procedure. So we start by just taking out, let's just take one of the random variables we have in the non-standard normal distribution. And we're going to use a table to tabulate our results out. So First, we're going to select a random variable to convert, and let's just pick the one that's here on the edge. So 950 is going to be our random variable that we want to convert over. So let's go ahead and put that in our table. And then we're going to apply our formula. So going from, the, from a non-standard to a standard normal distribution means we're going to use that z-score formula. So we apply the appropriate conversion equation, which, as I said, is our z-score equation. We plug in our numbers, so our, our random variable is 950. The mean, as we said before, was 1010, and the standard deviation is 20. Punch this out, and we get negative 3. So let's put that in our table next to the 950. So now we've got a, va a random variable value for the non-standard normal distribution paired up with its appropriate z-score for the standard normal distribution. We can repeat this process for as many of the remaining values as we want. So let's say we take the next one in line, 970. So we have our z-score formula. We plug in the 970, punch it out, and we get negative 2. So we put that into our, into our table. We can actually end up going through the rest of the values that we see there for our non-standard normal distribution. And we can do the same sort of calculation with each one of those and put those values in the table. And we see that those come out to be the z-scores that form our standard normal distribution. 
That's really all there is to it. Let's look at a practical example involving test scores. So the scores for a recent exam in a history class are normally distributed with a mean score of 76.8 and a standard deviation of 2.67. What then is the probability that a randomly selected student will score an A on the exam? Assume an A is any score of 90 or more. Well, the easiest way to solve this is to use StackCrunch. So here we go. Put up the normal calculator from StackCrunch. Notice how we've changed out of the standard normal distribution values that come as a default with the calculator. So we just go ahead and just put the mean score from our non-standard normal distribution in the calculator. Here's the standard deviation for that distribution. And then we want the probability that we get an A, which is anything that's greater than or equal to 90. 90 or more. So we put those, we put those selections there and then press compute and out comes our probability, which as you can see for this particular class, it's really, really small. So be glad you're not in this class because it's really hard to get an A. Let's look at another example involving the same class. So we've got the same distribution, same mean, same standard deviation. Now what's the probability that a random selected student will score a B? We're defining a B as any score between 80 and 89.9. So remember when you're in StackCrunch, and again, that's the easiest way to solve this problem, you want to go into that normal calculator and select that between option at the top of the calculator so that you can put both of your values in here into your probability calculation. You want it to be more than 90, uh, more than 80, but less than 89.9. Then you hit compute, and out comes your answer. 0.115. So it's way more likely you're going to get a B than an A. Note that you have to select that between option when your area under the curve has two definite boundaries, one on the left and one on the right. If we look and say, okay, for the same class, what's the probability that a randomly selected student will score a C or lower? In other words, less than 80% on the exam. Well, we go back into StackCrunch. That's the easiest way to do this. Our normal calculator that we already have called up. And we're going to switch back to the standard option. So there at the top, you want to make sure you press standard. And then down below, make sure you enter in less than or equal to for your drop down option. Put the 80 for the, field, for the, for the Z score field. And then you're going to get an area of 0.8846, which is the probability that we're actually going to get less than a B on the exam. Apparently, there's something going on with this class. The students aren't doing what they need to be doing, or the professor is just so awful that there's no way the students can be doing what they need to be doing. Either way, the probability we get a score of a C or lower is 88%. The power of standardizing normal distributions manifests itself most plainly when you're calculating probabilities and percentiles. So, as you saw from, from the previous lecture, when, you're when you use a standard normal distribution, you can easily use a C-score table to calculate out the pro probabilities and percentiles. Source uh, StackCrunch does away with some of this because it's doing a lot of these transformational conversion calculations for you. But let's go ahead and look at how the, how the table is used in this regard. Z-score tables and software each allow us to calculate probabilities of percentiles easily. And then once we have our percentile or probability, we can convert our Z-score back to its equivalent for the non-standard random variable value to find the value of interest. Without standardizing normal distributions, finding probabilities and percentiles for non-standard normal distributions would be very, very painful. Uh, assuming that and this is mostly true in the days when we didn't have the software commonly available to us to help us. So typically what this would mean is without the software, and if we don't standardize the normal distribution, we'd have to have a separate table set out for each specific normal distribution that we use. Yikes, how incredibly painful would that be to create? Uh, the other option that we would go with is say, well, 
We're not going to make specific tables, but we're going to have to perform a specific integral calculus calculation for whatever probability or percentile that we want to find and look for. That's also really painful. Much, much easier to be living in the 21st century and have all of this software available to us that does all these calculations very, very easily. Let's look at the same class that we were looking at before. Mean score of 76.8, standard deviation 2.67. So what test score corresponds with the 75th percentile? Well, again, we're going to use StatCrunch and not the tables to do this because it's way easier in StatCrunch. So if we go back to our normal calculator, notice how we put 75% in for the area under the curve. Notice that we have the area to the left. So we have the area to the left of the particular value that we're looking for. And <clears throat> so we're going to use the less than or equal to here. And then this is the area underneath the curve. Notice that when we were calculating percentiles before, when we first introduced them, we were looking at all the numbers that were less than the number of interest. The corresponding correlation for the standard normal distribution, or for any normal distribution for that matter, is to take the area to the left of the value of interest. That value of interest is our test score that corresponds with our percentile value, which in this case is a 78.6. So this is the test score that corresponds with the 75th percentile. Remember, percentiles will always be the left-sided area underneath the curve. That's how we were calculating percentiles when we were looking at them originally. We we're looking at all the numbers that are less than that, counting them up. So that's what we're going to do here with the distribution curve. Take the area to the left of our value of interest. So let's look at another example involving the 90th percentile. So for the same class, what test score corresponds with the 90th percentile? I'll give you a moment to calculate that in StatCrunch and then we'll look to see what the right answer is. Again, the easiest method is to use StatCrunch. And when you do that, here's your normal calculator. Here's what comes out. So we put our mean and our standard deviation in, which you should have from the previous examples. And then we're going to do less than or equal to, because we want the area to the left, the 90th percentile comes in here for the area, 0.9. That's the area underneath the curve. To compute, and out comes 80.2. That's going to be the test score that corresponds with the 90th percentile. Quartiles become easy to calculate with the stack crunch as well because quartiles, remember, are just simply set percentiles. So what test score corresponds with the third quartile? Again, I'll give you a moment to calculate that. The easiest method is to use StatCrunch. Here's what it should look like when you punch it out in your normal calculator. So we're going to have 75%. That's the third quartile here in the area field. And then less than or equal to here for your drop-down selection. And then you're going to hit Compute and get this number here for your test score that corresponds with the third quartile, which is 78.6. Remember, quartiles correspond to quarter parts of our data set. So the first quartile is 25%. The second quartile, which is the same as the median, but for a normal distribution, that's also the mean value, 50%. And then the third quartile, 75%. Let's look at an example from the real world. So there's an organization known as Tall Clubs International. And in order to join this organization, which is really originally organized for very tall women, a woman must be at least 70 inches tall. So if we have a distribution for the heights of women that's normally distributed, and it has a mean of 63.8 inches, standard deviation of 2.6 inches, what percentage of women will satisfy the height requirement and are able to join Tall Clubs International. Well, first we're going to convert the random variable to a z-score. So we do that with our z-score 
equation. So we take that random variable, the 70 inches, that's the requirement, that's our random variable of interest. We're going to subtract out the mean value from the distribution, 63.8, divide by the standard deviation, 2.6, and we get 2.38. That's our z-score. Now that we have our z-score, we know what that actually corresponds with. It must be at least 70 inches. So we're looking to the area to the right underneath the curve. So we have to quantify that area with the associated z-score. You can use StatCrunch or the tables to do that. If we use the tables, what we're going to do is find the area in the table that corresponds with 2.38. So here on the portion of a z-score table that I've provided on the screen, can you identify what that area is for the z-score of 2.38? Of I hope you picked this value here, 0.9913, that corresponds with the 2.38. So now we've got an area of 0.9913. But remember, that's the area to the left. We want the area to the right. So we're going to have to take the complement. Use that area to calculate your probability. So the probability of being greater than 70 is the probability that our z-score is greater than 2.38, which is the same as 1 minus the 0.9913 from our table. Again, why the 1 minus? Because the z-score table is listing the area to the left of the z-score. We want the area to the right, so we have to take the complement of the table of the value we get in the table. If we're using StatCrunch, all we have to do is just switch our inequality sign there in our drop-down menu selection and we don't have to worry about taking the complement. But with the table, yes, that is a concern, and we have to make that operation. So we subtract that out, and we get 0 0.0087. This, then, is the area underneath the curve and is the probability or the percentage of women that satisfy that height requirement. It's also the probability that a randomly selected woman is going to satisfy that height requirement. Now, for many years, Tall Clubs International was an organization simply for tall women. But the ladies kind of got, after a while, they, they kind of got bored of, you know, associating amongst themselves. They said, hey, let's bring some guys in here. So they actually, Tall Clubs International now admits men as well as women. The standard for men, though, is higher than that for women. Last time I checked, I think it was 74 inches. It might be a little different today. Uh, but at any rate, the men have to meet a different standard than the women in order to join Tall Clubs International. Let's look at a few housekeeping items before we move on. Again, I want to reemphasize that we want to avoid confusing z-scores and areas because if you get those two confused, wow, you can see how a lot of this is just going to, you know, not, not do very well for you. Remember that z-scores are distances along the horizontal scale. So they can be positive, which means they're on the right side of the mean value, they're in the center of the distribution, or they can be negative, which places them on the left side of the mean. Areas are regions under the normal distribution curve. They represent probabilities, and therefore they are never negative. So please, don't confuse these scores and areas. You want to make sure we keep those straight. In the z-score table, z-scores appear as column and row headings, but the areas appear in the body of the table itself. You want to go ahead and make sure you choose the correct side of the area under the curve. Are you looking at the left side or are you looking at the right side? Z-score tables usually list the area to the left of the z-score. So if you need the area to the right, you have to subtract the area to the left from 1. And typically, this isn't going to be a problem for many of you because I'm suspecting you're just going to use StatCrunch for all of your calculations. So then you have to remember, when you're using StatCrunch, you have to remember to select the right inequality sign for your probability calculation from that drop-down menu. Make sure you choose the correct side of the area under the curve. Let's look at a practical example where this can be very useful. So engineers that design passenger aircraft cabins have to balance uh, between functionality and cost. And for 
a design for an aircraft cabin that basically turns out to be balancing between allowing most people to stand inside the cabin, so there's your functionality requirement, but you want to minimize the weight. That's your cost requirement. The reason why that's a cost requirement is not so much from the cost of manufacture, although that plays into it, but the much larger cost that comes from actually operating the aircraft. One of the biggest costs to operating aircraft is fuel. The more your aircraft weighs, the more fuel you're going to need to get it off the ground and into the air, and the more fuel you're going to need to keep it in the air. So you can save an awful lot of money by minimizing the weight of your aircraft. So engineers who design aircraft cabins have to play this balancing act. You don't want to reduce the weight so much that, that the space inside the cabin is so small that people are having to crouch over. You want most people to be able to stand up. Obviously, you're not going to be able to cater to everybody, but you want to be able to, to encounter a good proportion of the population. So let's say that men have a normal distribution of heights with a mean value of 69.5 inches and a standard deviation of 2.4 inches. The question then is what ceiling height will allow 95% of men to stand erect? We can solve this using the tools for standard normal distribution that we've come to find so far. First, we're going to recognize that the probability is the area under the curve. So we're going to use that probability as the area under the curve. So here we have a normal distribution. It's non-standard, as you can see from the values here on your x-axis. But we have another axis here that's listing the z-values for a standardized distribution. The area of interest under the curve is 95%. Why is this the area to the left? Well, because we want people that we're looking for a maximum value that accommodates 95% of the people. So this 95% is going to be less than this boundary value of interest. We convert the area into a z-score. So we can do that by looking at a z-score table. So we want 95% from our z-score table. So where does 95% reside on our z-score table? Well, if you look, it should be right here. And this is the example that we saw earlier, 95% smack dab in the middle between two values there on the table. So that means the corresponding z value that comes out is going to be smack dab between those column headings up there. So we have the 1.6 added to 0 0.045, which gives us a z-score of 1.645. This then marks the boundary for the area underneath the curve for a standard normal distribution. We have a non-standard normal distribution. So what value of x for a random variable corresponds with a z-score of 1.645? Well, we can easily convert that using the equations that we saw earlier. So we take our conversion equation, we plug in what we know, we punch out the answer, and then we get 73.4. So now we've got 73.4 inches is a ceiling height that will accommodate 95% of men in standing erect inside the aircraft cabin. Let's say our statistics class takes an extended field trip. We saw that 95% of all men would be able to stand erect in an aircraft cabin if the ceiling height is 73.4 inches. So what percentage of our class would be able to stand erect inside an aircraft cabin with that ceiling height? So now we have the same sort of problem, only instead of doing it one way, now we're going to have to do it in reverse. So we're going to assume the same, we're going to assume the height measurements are distributed according to the mean and standard deviation for the numbers that we got earlier for measuring the heights for the class members. The easiest way to solve this problem is to use stack crunch. So here's our normal calculator. Again, we're going to look for, we have the ceiling height set, and we put in the values for the mean and standard deviation for the heights for our class because we want to know what proportion or percentage of the class is going to be able to stand erect underneath that ceiling height. And here we have the end value of 
95%. So, or if you want to round to one decimal point, 94.6% of the class could stand erect with that ceiling height. Note that when you use the software, it takes care of all the z-score conversions for you. So what we did in the last example, where we're using the table and we have to convert the z-score, that's a very old school approach to solving these types of problems. The glory and beauty of living in the 21st century is that the software does all of that for you. You have to make sure, however, when you're using the software, that you make the right selection from that drop-down menu so that you can use the right side of the area under the curve. Are you looking for the area to the left? Or are you looking for the area to the right? Make sure you choose the right side. So, just to review, here's the conversion process between standardized and non-standardized normal distributions. But it's actually part of a larger process that ultimately converts between random variables, which we see in rural distributions, and probabilities, which are of interest to us in solving different statistical problems. So if we start with the random variable side, notice that random variables, we can convert those to standard normal distributions, which then we can extract z-scores. The z-score table then allows us to get the area under the curve, which is the same as a probability. We can also do this process in reverse. We can say we have a probability, that's the area under the curve, use that with the z-score table to get a z-score, then we just have the standard normal distribution converted back to a non-standard normal distribution to get a random variable of interest. So we can work this process both ways. The beauty of the software is that all of this is automated. So this train of events is what's going on in the background when you're punching the buttons in StackCrunch. All you see are the endpoints here, the probability, and the random variable. But really what's going on is it's going through this process either one way or the other to give you the value that you're missing, either the probability or the random variable. That brings us to the end of this lecture. If you have any questions, you know what to do. Otherwise, I will see you in class or the next video. Thanks for watching.